to speak about uh, drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Uh, this is one of the very, very advanced or very um, uh, recent uh, endoscopes uh, uh, to be done by all ENT. Uh, it's uh, very important to know how to perform sleep endoscopy, why to do sleep endoscopy. It's not just to, to insert a flexible endoscope into the upper airway and uh, just to look at uh, the airway during sleep. You need to know uh, how to do it properly uh, when the patient is asleep, when to do it, and what is what is meant by advanced uh, sleep endoscopy. Um, um, my name is uh, Dr. Ahmed Yassim Bahgat. I'm a lecturer of otolaryngology at Alexandria University, and I'm a consultant of sleep surgery uh, in, uh, at the university. Um, I have learned sleep endoscopy by Professor Claudio Vicini, uh, 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 professor of otolaryngology and sleep surgery at the University of Ferrara in Italy. Uh, and uh, an ex-professor of Pavia in Italy. Uh, he was one of the main uh, uh, inventors of uh, that technique. Uh, he taught sleep endoscopy for almost uh, every sleep surgeon in the world. He invented his uh, own classification, so I'm honored to be one of his students. Uh, I also learned sleep endoscopy from Professor Eric Kizirian, one of the main inventors also of uh, sleep endoscopy and inventor of both classification of sleep endoscopy. So I'm going to give you what I've learned there uh, in this uh, presentation. So uh, sleep endoscopy, or what's called drug-induced sleep endoscopy, dies is a fiber optic examination of the upper airway and the proper sedation to determine the exact site of upper airway vibration in case of snoring and upper airway obstruction or collapse in cases of obstructive sleep apnea uh, patients. So, uh, so it's uh, a tool to detect the site of obstruction. Site of obstruction. Uh, it's not like sleep study. Sleep study is to detect what's going on during sleep as, as regards quality. But sleep endoscopy just to see the anatomy, uh, what's going on in the upper airway. It's not that uh, recent technique. It's since 1978, uh, where. Uh, uh, Brovecki uh, invented the fiber optic examination of uh, sleep apnea patients, but in uh, 1991, Pringle and Croft uh, uh, presented the drug-induced sleep endoscopy to use a drug in order to induce sleep so that we can examine patients while they are asleep, uh, what's going on and where is the site of uh, obstruction. Uh, what's our aim? To give the patient anesthesia uh, until you reach deep sedation. This is a stage of sedation just before general anesthesia, where you give a patient a drug to depress his consciousness, so he is now asleep. During that, uh, you can examine him. Uh, during that stage, you can arouse the patient. You can apply painful stimuli to the patient, so the patient can be aroused. So the patient is asleep. He's not in general anesthesia. It's not uh, comatose. No, the patient is just in deep sedation, not like or moderate sedation, but deep sedation. So uh, uh, a stage before uh, going into a gener general anesthesia. How to induce sleep? There are lots of drugs to induce sleep, but one of the most commonly used drug is propofol. Propofol is very fast acting drug, less than one mi minute of action, and it lasts for three to eight to 10 minutes. Uh, there is no uh, antidote for propofol, but just it's rapidly destroyed in the body. So it's very safe. You can use it in the, um, in a small center, in a, in a small equipped operating theater, you don't need uh, any um, precautions or uh, antidotes to uh, uh, antagonize its effect. So it's very, very, very good drug to use. Um, it it causes apnea sometimes when you give the drug in a very large dose. It may cause induce apnea by propofol. So it's very important to know how how we give propofol to the patient to reach the uh, deep sedation stage, the stage before uh, general anesthesia. Some people criticize dyes that it is, it's not natural sleep. You can't depend on it on uh, judging the, the quality of sleep or the sites of obstruction. But this is, this is the answer. Here's a, a, a study made by a, a group of uh, Brazilian uh, uh, surgeons. They studied propofol induced sleep and they performed polysomnography and EEG for patients, natural sleep versus uh, drug-induced sleep. And they found that you, you can have this, again, not 
perfect image of the EEG during drug-induced sleep, but you can have the same respiratory patterns like in uh, natural sleep. So the same apnea hypopnea index, same uh, degree of collapse, same sites of collapse. So you can use uh, probofol-induced sleep as a method to detect uh, what's going on during natural sleep. Uh, it's not natural sleep, but it, it's the same uh, degree and same pattern of obstruction like natural sleep. How, how to perform sleep endoscopy? This is very important. I'm, I'll take you step by step in order to know how to do it in a very uh, simple way. And, um, and it's very important in, in, in sleep apnea patient. Uh, it's very easy to learn how to do surgery for the palate and for the tongue base and uh, do that, uh, cut uh, that and uh, uh, stitch that. But it's very important before doing that to judge which patient is legible for that surgery and, and the, the, another patient is legible for the other one. Here's the European position paper on drug-induced sleep endoscopy. Um, all the experts of sleep endoscopy in Europe, they gathered together and they, they wrote like, like a guideline uh, paper, guidelines paper on sleep endoscopy. So I, I advise you to read this. This was in uh, 2014 and there is an update in 2017. Uh, both of them are very, very important for you to read before doing sleep endoscopy. Here is the procedure in steps. Uh, what about pre-medication, patient preparation, patient positioning, local anesthesia, endoscopy, if there is special maneuvers and the before discharge. Thanks to Professor Claudio Vicini for teaching us these uh, uh, steps. Pre-medication, we don't give any pre-medication to the drug, to the patient. No drugs. Uh, don't give atropine. Don't give uh, any drug before doing sleep endoscopy. Take the patient to the OR, and the first thing you give is propofol. Um, what is patient preparation? We just need IV cannula to give the patient the drug, IV cannula, saturation, oxygen saturation. Uh, if you have ECG and the microphone, it's okay. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, if these are uh, other options, polysomnography, EEG, or uh, bispectral index, GIS. Uh, we put the patient in supine position on the back with a pillow under his head, a comfortable pillow. It's better to put the patient on not the, the OR uh, table, it's better to put it on, on a bed, a uh, comfortable bed, in a dark room, cover his eyes, quiet room. So you are simulating uh, the, 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 the environment of sleep so that the patient may go into sleep without giving him a lot of drug to induce his sleep. We don't give any local anesthetic. Sometimes you can put local anesthetic on the, on the scope itself, uh, like uh, xylocaine gel, but don't put uh, local anesthetic in the airway because it sometimes it irritates the patient, keep him awakened uh, by the bad sensation in his throat. Uh, we can use uh, the basic endoscopy or the dynamic one. This is the, the, the analog endoscope with the camera and the, and, the, and the vision system or the analog one with the uh, chip on the tip, the camera on the tip of the endoscope. And this is a digital image better for recording and for patient uh, counseling. Here is the OR setting, there is the patient like that. On his right is the uh, uh, anesthesia. On the head of the patient, we, we usually uh, stand up. Uh, some, some schools say that you, you sit or stand uh, on the right side of the patient and you introduce the scope like as if you are doing a wake endoscopy, but I, I have learned that from Professor Vicini to stand at the head of the patient and look into the airway with the posterior pharyngeal wall downward and everything anterior coming uh, upward, like the palate, the tongue, and the epiglottis. So you can imagine when, with the gravity, what's going on and how the palate falling back and the, the tongue falling back. So it's better. Uh, but if you uh, if you know how to do it when you are on the right side of the patient, it's okay. It's not wrong. And if you have a microphone or a polysomnography, you can use it to record snoring and to monitor the uh, sleep during uh, the endoscopy. And here's how we give the drug. We put the IV cannula in the patient and we can give the propofol by three methods. Either manual, manual method, the repeated bolus technique or mechanical, the uh, syringe pump or what we call target controlled infusion. The, this is the repeated bolus technique. We give the patient repeated bolus of uh, propofol uh, every, every 20 seconds. So to, to keep the patient uh, deeply sedated. The problem of the repeated bolus technique that there is here is the, the level of the propofol in the blood you can see here how it is swinging up and down up and down and there is accumulation so when you give the first injection 
the level increase and they, when you give the second injection the level is higher and higher and higher so the patient when you give more propofol the patient become more deeply sedated or even into a general anesthesia like uh, in total intravenous anesthesia so sometimes propofol when you give it in a repeated bolus technique you can't have steady sleep and you have the patient uh, very what we call very narrow observation window so that we you can miss some some uh, findings during the fluctuation of the protocol. The other methods is to use the syringe pump or the target controlled infusion. Here we give the propofol in a constant way. What's the difference between the syringe pump and the target controlled infusion? The syringe pump, you just write on the pump uh, the amount of, the, of propofol you want to have inside the patient's blood. But in target controlled infusion, you write on the pump what the amount of propofol you want to have in the brain of the patient. And this is more, more accurate to have a constant level of propofol in the brain so that the patient is in a steady sleep. You can have a, a, a ample time to watch what's going on during uh, sleep and to judge on the airway in a proper way. So this is the best to use the target controlled uh, infusion. Uh, so in, in here are the admi uh, administration rules. We can use it by uh, repeated bolus technique or by TCI. By TCI, we start by 1.5 microgram per milliliter, and then every two minutes we increase 0.2 microgram per milliliter until we reach the proper level of sedation. I, I'll tell you how to know that you are in the proper level of sedation. Here is how to know the depth of sedation. If you have the basic setting, you can judge by the endoscope or by the oxygen saturation. Or if you have advanced setting, you can judge by if you have polysomnography or, or BIS. If you have oxygen saturation, when the oxygen saturation starts to drop below 90, so you are now in a state of apnea, so you start to judge on the airway at that time. What about the uh, endoscopy finding? We have to reach a cycle called snoring, hypopnea, apnea cycle. So the patient starts to snore after snoring for few seconds, there is hypopnea and there is relaxation of the upper airway muscles, and then there is complete cessation of breathing and apnea. So we, we, we have to judge on that apnea when it is preceded by snoring and hypopnea. But when you have apnea at the beginning, sometimes it's due to probofol, so you don't judge on that apnea at the beginning. If you have polysomnography, you can see that, that there is apnea now in the polysomnography and you can judge at that time, or VIS, uh, as I'll, I'll, I'll tell you now. So the saturation here, if the saturation starts to drop below 90, we start to judge. Or if we have BIS, BIS means uh, live EEG. It's uh, EEG continuous during uh, sleep. Um, many centers now use EEG, uh, BIS, not for sleep endoscopy, for all kinds of anesthesia, in order to judge that the patient is in a, a well state of uh, general anesthesia. You know, if I do BIS for myself now, it will be give recording of 100%. So my brain activity is 100%. I'm alert, I'm talking to you, you are uh, awake, so you, you are 100%. If a patient is in brain death, the brain is dead, so it gives you 0%. If the patient is general anesthesia, and his abdomen is opened, and he is doing surgery, he has surgery to be done to him, his BIS is not zero, it's 30%. And the brain activity is 30% during general anesthesia. What? What's our aim during sleep endoscopy to reach between 50 to 60 or 70%. From 50 to 70%, BIS is a state of deep sedation. So the patient is not awake and is not in deep general anesthesia. He is like asleep, like normal normal uh, person. So during that, uh, now he is close to general anesthesia. Now he is awake. No, so we need to reach a, a number in between 50, 60 or 70. When you have BIS number is 50, 60, or 70, now you can look at the airway. This is the patient while asleep. This is a good time to watch asleep. Or if you have a sleep endoscopy, a sleep study, a polysomnography. If you have a polysomnography, you can do the endoscope like that, and you are watching the finding here, and you have a sleep, sleep physician with you. And when you see in the endoscope, I can see collapse now in the endoscope. The sleep physician can tell you yes. Now this this collapse is obstructive sleep apnea. So this is a full optional uh, sleep endoscopy. You can see the the finding, the screen of the monitor, saturation and BIS. Here is the polysomnography, and you can see 
judge during the patient apnea and from external view to see the uh, paradoxical bleeding during uh, obstructive apnea. But now we, we introduce the scope, we gave uh, the drug, now we, we know that, that the patient is sedated and the patient is in deep sedation. What do we have to look for? So we have to look, we have to follow some classification. We have to follow a rule. You know that it's it's usually known that the eye cannot see what the brain doesn't know. So if you don't know what what are you looking for, you you'll just put the scope there and you, and you'll take it out and you you'll have no idea about what did you see. In the position paper, we have a lot of classifications published already published by eminent surgeons on sleep endoscopy. But the most common of them is the vote classification. Vote stands for velum, oropharynx, tongue base, and epiglottis. There is no nose in the in this classification because the nose is is fixed uh, while awake and while asleep, but so it's not necessary to put the nose. And in the velum, we put the degree of collapse uh, and the pattern of collapse, anterior lateral or circular. Uh, oropharynx means the lateral pharyngeal wall collapse, the, the tonsils and lateral pharyngeal wall. The velum is a palate. Tongue base is usually anteroposterior. Epiglottis is either anteroposterior or lateral collapse at the level of the epiglottis. This is published by, vote published by Eric Zirian. Very easy to apply. Very well uh, known uh, in most of the centers of sleep surgery. The NOHL classification is by Professor Claudio Vicini. I, I, I follow this classification. I learned sleep endoscopy by Professor Claudio Vicini, so he, he, he invented this classification. It includes nose. Oropharynx, oropharynx here includes either the vellum and the lateral oropharyngeal airway, so both uh, hypopharynx. Hypopharynx is not the uh, pyriform sinus or, or postic required area. It's not an anatomical name. It's an endoscopic name. It means the area of the tongue base and the oropharyngeal airway around the tongue base. And larynx uh, means either epiglottis or even the vocal cord. Here's the NOHL classification. Uh, the nose may be Maybe snoring at here at the salpingopharyngeal hole at the nasopharynx, and the obstruction is here in the nasopharynx in the salpingopharyngeal hole, or in the oropharynx. Oropharynx, like here in the villum, there is a vibration here now in the, in the villum, or maybe here in the lateral wall, the tonsils. Now you can see that the tonsil can, can cause every obstruction, and the tonsil can cause snoring. You can see this finding even in children, okay. in children with uh, with um, not very big adenoid and very big tonsils. Sometimes that the tonsils can cause uh, the tonsil can cause uh, snoring and airway obstruction. And hypopharynx, like look at here, the lateral wall of the hypopharynx, it can compress even the epiglottis or the larynx, like this. In, in, Trap door uh, like this in the, in the, in the epiglottis, or it can be like this. There is occlusion of the of the of the epiglottis on itself, so that the airway above is okay, but the epiglottis is folded side to side, primary collapse in the epiglottis, or in the in the level of the glottis, in the patient of bilateral rhinitis edema, and uh, there is vibration of the rhinitis. Very unusual case, but. It, it may may happen that the vibration will be at the level of the vocal cord. So at each level we comment: is it a vibration or collapse? And and we we comment: what is the degree of collapse from one to four? One means twenty five percent, two fifty percent, three seventy five percent, and four hundred percent. And the pattern either it's anteroposterior or lateral or transverse, or both of them can circular, anteroposterior and lateral. Uh, and we comment, we write that like in TNM classification of the tumors, uh, N3 means 75% nasal obstruction, O4C means 100% circular obstruction at the level of the oropharynx, H3AP means 75% obstruction and posterior at the level of tongue base, at the hypopharynx, and uh, L0 means no, no laryngeal, uh, laryngeal collapse. So this is like to make uh, 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 the terms uh, universal and to um, to have a common consensus that the uh, patient has this finding and and we agree upon it and we start to manage them accordingly. 
before finish before finishing the sleep endoscopy we have to do some maneuvers these maneuvers will give you an idea about the, the success of your treatment like joe lift we we, we lift the jaw uh, anteriorly not maximum uh, lift of the jaw because maximum lift will cause the will cause awakening of the patient it will awaken the patient will open their way but it will awaken the patient we just pull anteriorly the jaw because if it's okay it will give you an idea that the oral appliance will be a good uh, uh, therapeutic option for the patient about chin lift we just close the mouth some patients will start to sleep they open their mouth when they open their mouth there is red through uh, gnatic movement of the of the mandible and the downward movement of the mandible uh, and of course with the tongue downward and backward towards the airway it will close the airway but but simply with, when closing the mouth it will open up the posterior uh, uh, airway space so if the patient has uh, improvement after chin lift so you can just tell him to, to close his his uh, mouth during sleep and there are many 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 like a chin slip or uh, whatever and then we put the patient on lateral positions because many many patients have positional sleep apnea especially if you have sleep study that states that the sleep uh, apnea is more on the back or more on the one side so you have to put the patient on the side that uh, is worse on uh, on the sleep study and uh, sometimes we can use this george gauge system in order to see how many uh, how many centimeters we need or millimeters we need to advance the mandible in order to have a, a wide uh, posterior airway uh, space and this is a very important uh, step in the sleep endoscopy is to counsel the patient is to give him uh, to show him the video what's going on during the sleep and to discuss with him the options for to open up the, their airways it's very important because some patients when you tell him you have redundant soft tissues in the palate you have uh, uh, long uvula you have big tonsils sometimes they don't understand it don't, especially if they already have been operated before and the surgery didn't work well so uh, it's better to show them the airway during sleep to show them the video and then to discuss with them the uh, different options so why to perform sleep endoscopy is it really matter to perform sleep endoscopy for such patients because many 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 authors now are criticizing sleep endoscopy because it, it's just waste of time it's just waste of uh, money and uh, give the patient unnecessary drug and why you can examine him while awake and you can do whatever i i, I think it really matters because the, in this study um, Professor Claudio Vicini studied more than 250 cases or 60 cases, and he found that there is 76% of mismatch between awake and sleep endoscopy. So I think in four patients, one patient you will hit the problem, and three patients you will miss them, either in the pattern or in the grade of airway obstruction in the oropharynx and in the hypopharynx. Moreover, the, the, the video of the laryngeal obstruction, you can never see why the patient is awake you can say that the here patient has long epiglottis but you can never see airway obstruction at the level of the epiglottis without giving the patient propofol and doing sleep endoscopy whatsoever uh, so it's very important how how uh, how many patients it's about 12 percent of patients having primary epiglottic collapse sometimes you have 16 percent secondary or or both and so you have almost 30 percent of cases have laryngeal obstruction that cannot be diagnosed with a weak endoscope so you are going also to miss one third of your cases without without proper diagnosis so uh, so it's very important to because it's not the same like an awake endoscopy and you are missing one third of your cases in snoring the aim of sleep endoscopy just we are just looking for vibration go into the airway and look at the vibration with, with the audible snoring and then trying to fix it but in sleep apnea, we are not looking for snoring. We are looking for airway obstruction and collapse. So in order to reach the, the collapse, we need to be in, in what we call the observation window. Observation window, uh, that's, uh, as I told you, that if you have BIS, it's between BIS 50 and 70. If you don't have BIS, you are waiting for ap snoring, hypopnea, apnea cycle. You have to have apnea fo following snoring not apnea at the beginning no, don't judge on that apnea and 
keep repeat that cycle the patient will snore and then stop snoring a hypopnea and then apnea and then desaturation and then oh, it starts snoring again and, and and different cycles so don't judge in one cycle keep trying in different cycles because to in order to have a, a, a accurate diagnosis of the airway and uh, we we are we also look for the oxygen saturation here is the oxygen saturation the oxygen saturation start to drop with the apnea till down and then uh, recovers again uh, when you perform sleep endoscopy it's better to have a report of sleep study sleep study polysomnography that, that you have before and look at the sleep study at the uh, mean oxygen saturation during the study without propofol and the lowest oxygen saturation what we call the nadir the lowest oxygen saturation and you should examine the patient between these two saturations so if the patient for example the mean oxygen saturation is 95 and the, the lowest oxygen saturation is 75 so if the saturation between 75 and 95 this is the area where you you can examine but if the saturation drops below 75 so this is induced by propofol it's over over uh, obstruction induced by the drug if the saturation is more than 95 it's usually the patient is most probably he's awake he's not well sedated so don't look at that at that time because sometimes you don't have even snoring and so so you say no you don't snore no uh, if you want to say you don't snore and you want to tell the patient you don't snore this is my conclusion you have either to have a bis and the patient between 50 to 70 and no snoring or in the saturation um, between the mean and those oxygen uh, saturation in case of stridor if the patient is complaining mainly of stridor we wait for the vocal cord vibration and audible uh, stridor look at the vocal cord mainly. do we do sleep endoscopy for all cases in in my experience i do them for all cases all sleep surgeries if even if i i, I, I diagnose them with the awake examination and the patient has big tonsils that you know it whatsoever before going into surgery at the same setting of surgery i ask the anesthesiologist to give uh, the patient the propofol induce sleep and do it but when to do sleep endoscopy as a sole procedure take the patient to do sleep endoscopy and then uh, return him back uh, if, if you have a, a vague complaint, the patient is not complaining mainly of snoring and sleep apnea, he is complaining also of stridor and different sounds during the sleep, so I'm not sure what's going on. If you have surgical failures, it's very important. If the patient is already did UP3, septoplasty, nasal surgery, fungal surgery, and he's still complaining, we don't, the patient usually is afraid to have another surgery and another pain without having a, a ground, solid gr uh, ground diagnosis uh, if you have mismatch between clinical and instrumental diagnosis if you have clinical clinical symptoms i mean instrumental means the polysomnography so if the patient is complaining of severe sleep apnea loud story and the sleep study comes to you is mild sleep apnea so you have to judge which is true and vice versa if the patient is not complaining and your sleep study comes with severe obstructive sleep apnea so it's better to judge uh, which is true uh, and in case of of course moderate to severe sleep apnea before major surgeries like robotic surgery like um, multi-level surgery in sleep uh, severe sleep, uh, sleep apnea and of course for clinical research to see the effect of CPAP or, or oral appliance here's what we call advanced sleep endoscopy here are my great great friends and great uh, doctors from Italy Dr. Marcello Bozzi who is a pulmonologist he used to do also CPAP with the dyes to, to, to put the CPAP on the patient and to insert the sleep endoscopy uh, through a hole in the patient's uh, in the, in the face mask and to judge if the CPAP is okay or if there is anything obstructing it. And my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ricardo Coppi, from, uh, also from Bologna, from Italy, he also studied and he has very good experience to use mandibular advancement devices with drug induced sleep endoscopy. Here's, for example, a case, uh, this is a very interesting case, a patient who is 80, 80 years old, quite old, uh, ischemic heart disease, diabetic, uh, hypertensive, he has a lot of comorbidities, and he has severe obstructive sleep apnea, the AHI is 37. Uh, mainly, we can't say he is supine because he needs to sleep uh, more than 50% on his back, but anyway, he's more on the, on the back, but severe sleep apnea. 
and uh, the patient reported that when he started to use CPAP, he was really bad. He, he used it for a couple of days and he started to stop it. So we did sleep uh, endoscopy for him and we found that with the sleep endoscopy, he start to sleep like that. This is one of the 12%. Yes, I can say that it's 12%, but I, I see it maybe every month, this finding. There is a collapse of the epiglottis backward, and when they use that CPAP, the CPAPs make the epiglottis collapse more, so the patient got worse. So when, when we did sleep endoscopy, we did jaw thrust, and we found that with the jaw thrust, the patient is improving. So we we told the uh, told the patient that he can use oral appliance or mandibular advancement device during the sleep so that avoid this uh, uh, collapse. He is eight years old, not a good surgical case, so we wanted to see, say, uh, to see if the mat will be uh, sufficient uh, or not. He started to use mat. Now you can see, and during uh, his treatment, he reported that even with mat, he can't have a very good and very restful sleep, and uh, he couldn't imagine that. Uh, he reported that he is not okay, and uh, the orthodontist referred him to us in order to we want to check again with sleep endoscopy if the med needs more advancement because it, it's advanced about one centimeter how how it's advanced one centimeter and the patient is not improving we did also sleep endoscopy for this patient and we found that with the med in place again sleep the the, the epiglottis is, is collapsing but here's what 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 we found when the patient start to sleep the, the med slipped from his from his lower teeth. You can see you, you don't see the lower teeth. Here, here is the 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 jaw is in place, but here is after he he slept, the, there is uh, improper fixation of the lower teeth to the uh, oral appliance. And when we when we yeah, just put the the um, the oral appliance just in place, just the lower teeth we put in place, the airway uh, is open. So, so you can use sleep endoscopy to judge if the patient is properly using his uh, a way of treatment or not. So in this patient, uh, he said that uh, um, I'm using it, but uh, it's not working. But when we saw him, we found that it's, it's, it slipped during, during sleep like that. And after that, we did, uh, after proper fixation of the med, we did a sleep study for him, and the patient dropped from 37 to 14. This is a very good result. The patient is very happy, and, uh, and for that age, we, we could, with the sleep endoscopy alone, to identify at the best that this patient is not a good candidate for CPAP, and this patient is a good candidate for med, and even after failure of med, we could identify causes of failure of med, and we fix it. And the patient is now is now okay. So this is one of the main functions of what we call advanced sleep endoscopy, to use sleep endoscopy to prove the the, the, the treatment. So sleep endoscopy is not done only for surgical cases, not done only to do surgery after that. No, you can do sleep endoscopy for all cases, even before CPAP, in order to identify if the patient is a good candidate for CPAP or not. Finally, what we call pediatric sleep endoscopy. We we have a very good experience in in. in pediatric sleep endoscopy. We did more than 90 cases in pediatrics. The pediatrics, we, we, we use it to differentiate again between snoring and sleep apnea and stridor. Again, after surgical failures, but very important in syndromic cases like Down syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, and uh, pierre robin syndrome. We did a lot of cases in, in syndromic cases. Like in this case, in, 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 uh, in pierre robin syndrome, uh, one of the, uh, the cases of um, there is litrognathia and very, very um, undeveloped uh, skull. And um, another case that that patient he had uh, uh, cerebral ischemia and, uh, and and severely mentally retarded. We couldn't examine him by even by awake examination, and and we we did sleep endoscopy for him. This is one of the of the techniques of the to do sleep endoscopy. We, do, we use sevoflurane. It's inhalational anesthesia. We don't use propofol. Sevoflurane is very uh, rapid drug, very safe drug. You can use it in syndromic cases. Uh, you can give it by a mask and then good ventilation of the case and then insert the scope. And in order to com 
to continue flow of the of the of the of the fluorine we, we keep an endotracheal tube in the nose. Here is some example of cases uh, of pediatrics. Here is one year old male uh, child with snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. He was very uncooperative case to do uh, X-ray. So they asked the patient to give him anesthesia to do X-ray. So I advise you if if the patient has to to have anesthesia to do X-ray in the nasopharynx, give him the same amount of anesthesia. Sevoflurane is very safe and examine him and you can see if there is the adenoid and at the same time we, we can uh, remove the adenoid at the, um, at the same setting. Here is the second case with the Pierre Robin syndrome. Uh, he has small, very small adenoid but very severe obstructive sleep apnea. So we don't, it's not only the, the matter of adenoid in, in those cases. So here, here we are in the nasopharynx, here is, here is a small adenoid, here is the cavity, the airway, here is the palate. And, and when we go now, here is a retrolingual space, and here is the, the larynx. The, the patient was crying. He, he, is, he was awake at that time. At that time, he was awake. And then we give him the sevoflurane, and we start to sedate him to do uh, sleep endoscopy. And again, we insert the scope into the nose. Here is the nasopharynx. Again, here is the palate. And he, in between the nasopharynx and palate, we go into the airway, look into the hypopharynx. And when you see, we see that now there is complete collapse at the level of the tongue base, tongue base obstruction. So, and with mandibular advancement, just mandibular advancement, we found that, that the patient has a very wide airway. So, so he needed uh, distraction, osteogenesis, in order to distract the mandible forward. Finally, another case, uh, six months, six months old patient, severe obstructive sleep apnea. He has moderate adenoid, very small tonsils, but when we insert the scope now, so it's not a matter of tonsil and adenoid only. When we insert the scope inside in a six month, he, his complaint is just snoring and breath holdings during sleep you can see that that the, there is some sort of laryngomalacia, there is obstruction of the collapse of the epiglottis and supra uh, glottic uh, larynx on itself. Uh, so, so, the, so the problem was in the larynx itself. So that patient needs supraglottoplasty or airy epiglottolysis uh, with, with laser in order to, to widen the supraglottic larynx. It's more important than doing just simple TME. Finally, to conclude, sleep endoscopy in our hands proved to be simple, quick diagnostic tool, cost-effective in different settings. No complications was registered. However, don't do sleep endoscopy in your clinic. We do it in operating theater. We do it with the anesthesiologist giving the propofol. We have the tube and the laryngoscope available at the time. We can intubate the patient at any time, but we, we didn't have any problem in um, in a way obstruction during sleep endoscopy and the information uh, came from sleep endoscopy were implemented into treatment planning we used the information to tell the patient what's the treatment plan uh, what about the surgery what what are the other options than surgery and patient counseling was much more easier uh, using a video recorded by uh, sleep endoscopy to show uh, the patient so uh, sleep endoscopy is not just putting a flexible endoscope into the patient in a way and just look what's going on. No, you need to have to know how to, uh, the, the setting of the, of the patient, how to induce sleep, when to know that you are in a proper stage of sedation to judge the airway, and then uh, what are you looking uh, for. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like finally to thank Professor Claudio Vicini for his continuous teaching, teaching and his presentation and his slides. Thank you so much. Uh, uh,